So I want to welcome everybody to the first only, first of many, we'll see a discussion of films from the series region. Uh, we're starting tonight with uh, the white disease, the white plague, Vila Nemots in Czech. Uh, it is a film based on a play of the same name by Karel Čapek. Uh, the play and the film both came out at different points in the year 1937. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Karel Čapek, he is one of the most important Czech writers of certainly of the interwar period between World War I and World War II, uh, and one of the most important writers certainly of the 20th century as well. He is uh, known or perhaps should be known for having gifted the world with the word robot from his play R.U.R. or Rossum's Universal Robots, uh, which came out in 1920. Uh, uh, and then the other kind of famous science fiction work, just to kind of keep it in the realm of science fiction that he's known for is his novel of 1936, uh, which is called War with the Newts or Valka Smoky. Uh, which involves newts that learn to speak and, and then wage war upon the humans who taught them to speak. Uh, so uh, not unlike the robots who uh, ended up fighting back against the humans that created him. And so in addition to science fiction, yes, we are often uh, with Chopex in Chopex at Phi World in a kind of dystopic space or uh, on the brink bridge or the, the brink of a dystopia, the beginning of a dystopia. Uh, so one thing that I think is important to note, obviously, is that this play is one of the last things he wrote. It's not the last thing. It's not even the last play he wrote. He does have one last play called Mother, Matka, that, comes, uh, that uh, was written and, and premiered in 1938. Uh, so he himself uh, will die at the end. He dies on Christmas Day of 1938. Uh, so obviously the lead up to World War II is uh, fast uh, approaching and certainly given the focus of Hitler on Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenlands, uh, certainly among other, and just the proximity to then Czechoslovakia certainly made uh, Chopik very aware of what was going on. Uh, he was both anti-communist and anti-fascist, and certainly that political leaning colored the reception of this play and, and the film. Uh, so the people you think would like it definitely liked it, and the people you think wouldn't like it definitely didn't like it. Uh, so I don't think, it's not like he was fooling anybody with what this uh, play was a uh, play and then what the film is about. Uh, so uh, I think we'll, we'll stop there and maybe uh, actually get in, you know, to talk about the film. I will say that for the most part, I have to say that, that the film does a pretty, is a pretty accurate portrayal of the play especially as a play that's not easily accessible in English. I would say that if you're interested in Chopik's work and this is one you haven't had a chance to read or haven't been able to find in English, it can be very difficult to find in English. There are a few translations available, um, but again, they're not easily accessible. And so I would, uh, this is a good vehicle uh, uh, to gain access. Uh, you know, English access through the film with, with subtitles. So um, on well, that note- My boys, I have two boys. One, one of them is, how old is Arthur? <laughs> five? <laughs> Was he other, five? <laughs> five and eight. Um, it, they watched the whole thing. It, it was bizarre. I, I didn't yeah. expect them to watch a foreign black and white movie with subtitles. The entire way through but they were very interested uh generally speaking so it was very accessible um and i think in a way that a lot of old movies kind of aren't this one felt very modern uh in terms of the way scenes were put together the way the story sort of progressed it was easy to follow there weren't a lot of 
jumps and assumptions made of our understanding that made it hard to follow. Some movies from before this can do that. This one had a very sort of clear narrative structure for the most part. I would, yeah, I, I think one of the things I thought was interesting was that it seemed to keep what was the best parts of it as a play and kept a lot of dialogue and a lot of interaction between characters that I think often might have been cut or in some way changed. And so you have that big dramatic uh, uh, kind of climactic and long conversation between Dr. Galen and the Marshal. Uh, towards the end of the film. Uh, but yeah. they also, but it doesn't feel like you're watching a play, it still feels like you're watching a movie. That they do, they use the fact that they have a camera, they're on a set, they do these, they introduce them and, and you know, I was thinking of the way in which they cut back and forth and you see the Marshall's boots and you see Dr. Galen's shoes and you know, that they focus on different elements and they use that kind of element of montage, which they don't use a lot in this film at all. That kind of uh, technique, editing techniques, is not necessarily used a ton here, but in that moment, it really, you know, they forced your eye and, and really helped you make those clear comparisons between them and really set the stage for this, you know, kind of very dramatic engagement between these, these two characters. Uh, so maybe we should just briefly summarize the movie. Let me ask you, Esther, was this supposed to take place in a fictionalized country or was it supposed to be a sort of fascist version of Czechoslovakia? No, I mean, generally speaking, he, you know, uh, keeps things out of Czechoslovakia for the most part. So not, not exclusively. So War with the Newts, there is the Czechoslovakia there. Uh, um, but uh, are you are they're on a separate planet the 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 Rossum's robots are off uh in a different planet so uh right. i uh always read this as not m meaning to be trying to be more of an alternate world uh so that it could be more than one country and so that no one country can get off the be let off the hook uh as far so as far as the movie goes, there were images of Europe in outline. So it's like an alternate Europe, I suppose. It had a very Twilight Zone feel in that way. Yeah. You know, sort of a uh, a country in Europe. <laughs> you know. Right. So in a country in Europe, there is a dictatorial leader, the marshal, and the marshal is uh, arming his country for war. Uh, however, at the same time, the country is also beset by the White Plague, uh, which is sort of a version of leprosy, which afflicts people who are between 45 and 50 and up. So old people yeah. and not young people. Uh, so that seems like a certain theme there. Um, this disease shows itself initially by white spots on the skin, which have no feeling. And then I... They don't show this on screen, but I guess it progresses to a, you know, horribly, you know, pustulated, uh, you know, sort of Ebola type disintegration of the body or something. Very smelly. Uh, which is very I, smelly. Without, yeah, without them showing us and uh, they make it very clear that it stinks. Um, yeah, they didn't show, they didn't show the disease at all on screen, which was an interesting choice probably to save money, but uh, maybe also for um, artistic reasons. Anyhow, um, in addition to the Marshall, the other two main characters are uh, Professor Segalius, who is the administrator of sort of the state-run hospital, mm -hmm. and then uh, Dr. Galen, who is um, an independent physician who treats the poor. And it turns out that Dr. Galen has developed a cure uh, for the White Plague, and wants to test it in Professor Segalius's clinic, uh, which he is allowed to do, but he won't share the uh, procedure for making it uh, until and unless all of the sovereigns of the world agree to uh, swear off violence and war for eternity. Um, and so the, the, the plot sort of 
revolves around whether he's willing to compromise, whether he's willing to treat rich people as well as poor people, uh, and then what the marshal ends up deciding to do. I guess that's a fairly good non-spoilery synopsis of the yes, movie. I think that, that pretty much gets at it. Although I do think at this point, if you're really not interested in having any spoilers, I think at this point you might want to stop and watch the movie watch the film and come back. Uh, we can make sure there's a link to the film in the description. I think that should be easy enough to do uh, Perhaps uh, I will for those who are- Right here. Spoilers from this point <laughs> forward. Right. If you don't want spoilers, go watch the movie. It's available on YouTube with even with English subtitles uh, in high in a very high quality form. Uh, yeah. So whatever whatever mastering they did was excellent. It was very yeah. good. So I highly if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go watch it anyway. Uh, uh, but certainly, uh, I don't think there's any way to really get into the film without having a few spoilers. <laughs> uh, not that they would. Uh, necessarily ruin the film, uh, the enjoyment of it. But uh, so yeah, that's that is I think a pretty good uh, description of or kind of basic synopsis of of kind of the main the thrust of of the film. Uh, I don't know if you have anything you want to you kind of want to you know, as we move into to talking about uh, what you thought about that as a kind of theme, the ways in which the kind of juxtaposition of disease and war and uh, also just what you thought about that kind of dynamic of uh, playing, you know, of, of making that kind of ultimatum uh, for uh, peace. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a wonderful idea, the idea of peace. Uh, but to put just as many, if not more, more lives at risk or to, to, to condemn as many, if not more lives to death because you won't treat them or you won't treat them in the numbers or, or mass produce the cure. Yeah. I mean, I, there is an I, ethical concern, which, which I think the film uh, does a good job of not like I don't think Galen is completely let off the hook as this is a perfect this is a pure and not that there's no consequences to this idea. So, I agree. Uh, I, I think that um I know just from a personal emotional reaction standpoint, I found myself quite annoyed with Dr. Galen at several points uh <laughs> during the story. And I was quite annoyed with the Marshall and I was quite annoyed yeah. with Professor Segalius as well. They all had sort of very rigid belief systems um, that were in conflict with each other. Uh, Dr. Galen's belief system seemed to, his sort of calculus seemed to be that uh, it would serve the greater good to eliminate war uh, from the planet. He, his history is that he was a, a combat medic during the last great war uh, presumably a World War I type conflict with trenches. They mentioned trench warfare. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he has come to the conclusion that only completely eliminating war will uh, benefit humanity. Uh, and he's sort of using this uh, epidemic, which could turn into a pandemic, as a cudgel to get what he wants. Uh, but this involves actual human beings coming up mm -hmm. to him and asking for help and him refusing them. And then his basis for the refusal is how much money do you make? Uh, you know, the scene with oh, the Baron, Baron Krogh, uh, who tries to sneak in and get treated by pretending to be poor, um, it it flies in the face of the sort of traditional Hippocratic Oath type Hollywood doctor that we are used to. And so it, it, cut, it rubbed me the wrong way, I have to say. I don't know that I could personally refuse someone to their face to save their life uh, or to save their husband's or wife's life. It was pretty, pretty harsh. Um, on the other hand, the, the marshal, his philosophy, he had a specific quote near the end, which I think summed it up very nicely. And that was, 
it's only the blood of the fallen that makes a homeland what it is, uh, which seemed a very specific call out to the sort of blood and soil uh, populism and fascism. Um, he, he was very cavalier about human life. Uh, he thought that especially young people needed to die for their country. Uh, and so it seemed like they were trying to tie in the, the young and old disparity in the disease with the young and old disparity uh, with who fights wars. Um, I don't know if that theme was totally explored in a satisfying way in the movie. It was certainly hinted at it. It got me thinking, but they didn't sort of come down on it with a conclusive stance, I guess. Anyhow, his, his worldview uh, is that the nation is what's most important and that he is serving the interest of the nation in this particularly violent and aggressive uh, fascistic sort of way. Um, the professor's worldview, <laughs> I, I mean, he was a loyal subject of the marshal. Um, he, he was the one who advocated the idea of concentration camps or, or leper camps uh, to sort of contain the infection. Um, so he also seemed to have a somewhat cavalier attitude towards human life, uh, or at least a, a much harsher triage mentality than some doctors might have. Uh, you know, these people are expendable at this point. There, there's no saving them. Uh, but he was, un he was unwilling initially to even entertain trying out Dr. Galen's cure until Dr. Galen revealed that he was an old friend of his father's, you know, so like, he's like, who are you? We can't do this. This just isn't done, you know, which seems like a very satirical take on uh, totalitarian societies with uh, sort of racial uh, codification and racial laws. Um, Cause he mentioned that he was Greek and he's like, Oh no, 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 we can't have that. Greek stuff here. Nobody, yeah. No, nobody who's not from here, uh, even if you've been here basically your whole life, you know, that, that moment certainly stuck out to me for sure. Uh, I, I would say that, that he has that, he strikes me, uh, uh, Professor strikes me as that, you know, is, is he loyal? I suppose he's loyal. He's loyal to whoever kind of has given him power, his access to power. He's interested in, in his connection to power. And so it comes through, you know, f familial connections, you know, marrying into those connections, maintaining those connections through ties to, um, uh, uh, you, know, to you know, maintaining a connection by, by keeping close ties to the marshal and keeping the marshal happy and everybody who works for him happy as a way of maintaining his, the status quo. He likes where he is. I, I think you see it with the, the uh, accountant and his family, particularly the, you know, the, the father, the head of the family, the accountant, he likes the status quo. Life is working out well for him. He doesn't want to change anything. He doesn't want to rock the boat too much. Uh, he's, yeah, the, you know, the he, accountant and his family were a strange, like I understood who they were as characters, it almost seemed a little bit superfluous. And maybe that's the more play-like aspect. In a play, having one a one-room set for a house is a way to illustrate how the average bourgeois family feels about this yeah. or something. Um, but ultimately, like they had a son who was frail and a daughter who was kind of snotty but their characters didn't really come to much uh, in terms of the plot. No, I think I think I have seen a, a, a at Trapdoor earlier. I guess actually late last last year, um, uh, before we started our own pandemic, really, uh, or at the beginning stages of that, I saw this play in a production at Trapdoor Theater. 
And I think they were able to use the interaction in the family as a way to draw out that youth connection and the, the tension with the youth who are feeling like there's no room for them. And that, that only, that sense of there's no room for young people comes from the marshal in the film and that opening speech. He talks about, we need, we need space, but, but that doesn't, it, because it's not coming from actual young people, a young person saying we need, you know, we can't get a job. You have a great job, dad, that's great. But where, where's my job? Where do I go? Where do I, what, when do I get to move into my own place? Or, you know, wh where's the room for me here? There's no room for me here. So if that means we have to go to war to create room, then or if that means you, you have to get sick with this disease, then maybe you have to get sick with this disease because there's no room for us. Um, yeah. And that tension, I think, comes out a little bit more and there's no other real place for that tension to come out. And I think, you know, that's, that's one place. The other benefit outside of that kind of one room scene that works very well in a play, maybe left in the film, but it, it gives, I think you, you get to see Dr. Galen struggling with his choice not to treat, when he chooses not to treat people much more when he chooses not to treat the accountant's wife. That's a much harder choice for him. She in her, of herself, he, he doesn't have any problems with her. Had it just been her, he might very well have treated her. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but it's well, mostly because- What he asks of the accountant is totally unfair. It's like, okay, you work at the, the Baron's you know, weapons works, so make him stop making weapons. Like, how is this accountant going to manage that? Like, this yeah. is this is a ridiculous. Well, he, does, he does follow it up with a more, I think. I, I mean, you, whether you consider it legitimate, he just says, "Well, then quit, quit, and I'll treat your wife." And I, that to me is is uh, that's the sacrifice he's demanding. Again, I, it definitely does not meet up with the hypocritic of like I'm not. This is not. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying it's good doctoring necessarily. I mean, he is definitely issuing ultimatums. Dr. Galen is definitely issuing very difficult ultimatums and very much asking for a uh, huge, and in some cases, I think, you know, that first ask of the, of the accountant, almost impossible sacrifice, like they're, they're beyond their control, asking for maybe something beyond their control uh, in order for them to, live or for a loved one to live. I mean, that's, that's a pretty manipulative <laughs> ultimatum to put in front of someone, you know, quit your job or your wife dies. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm surprised he didn't do it. Uh, or did he did maybe the scene cut no. away. Yeah. I don't think he did. No, he, doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't quit. He, you know, he says how, you know, the response is, you know, I'm 50. Where would I get another job? Yeah. You know, I have a good job. Finally got this. He finally got his big promotion. You know, um, it, you know, and and in one sense, you know, why not just quit? Or you know, um, you know, there's a certain, you know, I, but to the best, you know, as as I watch that scene and have read in the past, I've always, you know, like that he doesn't do it. No. Um, now, you're right. Dr. Galen doesn't do what he does with, you know, the Baron, which is like shoot out the medicine onto the floor. Um, <laughs> just a little. I mean, that to me is again that shows. You know, I I like because it makes that character a little more complex. That he's not. Yes, he has. I think a very high ideal of trying to bring peace to the world, and this is this is his one way of doing it. He has found a cure this incredibly deadly disease. Nobody else knows it. Nobody else has figured it out. And he has this leverage, you know, it, you know, it, it is, this is what it means to play hard. When people talk about playing hardball, this is what it means to play hardball. I think it, for me, that's a good, it was a good reminder of when you're talking about playing hardball at this level and in, in these, in this type of world, this is what you're talking about. You're talking about being willing to not cure people when you have the ability to cure people of a deadly disease. Um, and that, I liked how the other- a higher goal, for a higher goal, which is to end all war, um, or at the very least to end the immediate war that's happening. 
and that's that's not a bad thing either so i like though how the other characters pushed back against dr galen uh segalius called him naive uh mm -hmm. the accountant mm -hmm. said this is impossible we've already spent billions on this and you know like now we're not going to use these things the marshal pushed back um and it, it gets the viewer and the reader asking questions about what is realistic of course Chapek is writing this after World War One, uh, you know, and at, at the Peace of Versailles and with the League of Nations, war was declared illegal from there on forward, right? Th these sorts of idealistic notions which don't meet up with the real world in practice. Uh, but it gets you asking questions, well, why couldn't it? Why couldn't you outlaw war? Why couldn't you forego these things? Um, so I, I was engaged by those questions. I thought it was a, a good way of asking those questions. You know, you mentioned Segelius, uh, the professor, sort of trying to maintain access to power. That reminded me, we don't want to talk for too long about it, I guess, but just uh, parallels to today's <laughs> situation. <laughs> There's no way not to go into them, I have to say. We have to talk about them some because you can't watch this film in today. In, in uh, you know, we are in, you know, early May of 2020 as we're talking about this film. And so, and having spent now many weeks in our own, in, in social distancing and, and various levels of quarantine and, or, you know, self isolate whatever we're, we're calling it. Um, and so as, as you know, we try and get a handle on COVID-19, and so it's impossible for various reasons not to see just uh, even more uh, connections to the real world or what's the contemporary world. Uh, and I often see with some of Chopic's writing. So anyway, I, I interrupted so you. So that's okay. The, the two scenes that stick out in my mind, <laughs> That I was like, wow, that's as true today as when it was written. Uh, one was Dr. Segalius, his being so obsequious in his praise of the, the president of his country, uh, which is very, very reminiscent of recent yes. scenes of the United States president visiting the CDC or visiting the Mayo Clinic and having these doctors just be effusive in their praise for the, the just spectacular job that he's done getting a handle on this pandemic. <laughs> yeah, uh, the other scene that stuck out uh, was um, when the marshal insisted on shaking uh, Baron Krogh's hand uh, because it was, it was manly and if he didn't shake his hand, this would be, you know, sort of a giving in to cowardice or giving in to, you know, being less than manly and less than a leader. And of course, this is very reminiscent of the United States current leaders' unwillingness to wear masks or not shake hands with people or to stay six feet apart from people. You know, they, they say these things are important occasionally but then they never ever put them into practice. Um, now the film and the play, I, I assume, did not have that juxtaposition of the, the messaging versus the behavior, but the behavior really stuck out as very emblematic of this sort of strongman mentality. Uh, I don't know if there were any other aspects that stuck out to you as really hitting the nose, Esther. <laughs> I mean, you, you definitely hit on on a couple of the ones that stuck out the most to me. I mean, there's all sorts of little things. Uh, I think I already mentioned uh, Professor Segalia's kind of wanting to almost out of hand reject Dr. Galen because he's foreign. Um, and so not being willing to accept a foreigner, just even though he could help you, just because he's foreign. I mean, that's certainly, even though he he's basically had spent his whole life you know, in this country. Uh, so, you know, that's certainly as, as a, it's not an, it's not that big of a theme, I th think in the, in the movie or, or, you know, um, but, but certainly that stuck out or, or 
know, the accountant reading his newspaper and being annoyed. Why are they talking about this plague? You need to stop talking about it. The media is horrible. I mean, he doesn't say the media is horrible, but these news, I'm never buying one of these newspapers again. Um, again, those are smaller. Uh, one, you know, that's more maybe thematic that really, um, uh, you know, stuck out to me was uh, as, um, I'm trying to remember exactly when the barons and who he says this to. I think the barons, is it, this is when he's talking in the scene where he's uh you know admitting to professor segalius that he has the disease or at least he has a white spot and and um you know they're talking about these these you know making these leper camps you know these concentration camps for people with oh, yeah. with the disease and there's two parts in that that and i i think they're both in that scene there's obviously the one where at, toward, as he's leaving he goes well, I guess I better start making more barbed wire, um, you know, so that even as he's sick and he's going to die and he might very well end up in one of these camps, he's thinking about how to make money. Yeah. But probably. then there's this other, there's this other moment. I think it's in that, I think it's a little earlier in that same conversation and they're talking, they're both talking, both Professor Scalius and the Baron are talking about how their patriotism and the ways in which the patriotism runs, you know, you know, basically an, an inch deep. And you know the Baron, you know, talking about how he did it for his country, and then he kind of almost in an offhand way, but is probably the most important. Like it was also good for my business interests, right? Like he, you know, um, he didn't sacrifice. Like he made a lot of money doing this for his country, and I think that that um, easy throwaway or like that that way of wrapping your best interests or your personal interests in the flag, so to speak, or in patriotism, uh, when really it's just like what you really want to do because it's going to make you a lot of money. And, and, and it's a way of not having to deal with the fact that, that you're making money by making gas that kills people. Like, hey, we had an accident and definitely that gas is very effective. Um, excellent. What a useful accident. Uh, um, or we're going to start locking sick people in camps. Great. I should... I sh thanks for the tip, right? Like, thanks for the tip. I'm going to start making barbed wire so I can cash in on this opportunity. Yeah. Even though, can, like, you know. You can imagine certain senators buying, you know, barbed wire futures or something. Uh, I, I mean, it was very much that kind of moment of, of I'm not thinking about, like, th that, that what it means to have to set up a camp like that, a human toll of that is instead of thinking about the human toll, it's thinking about the, that profit, you know, uh, going after profit. And I think we see that, you know, not just in the present day for this particular disease, although yes, absolutely insider trading by senators, <laughs> um, you know, like senators who've never really done a lot of trading, all of a sudden <laughs> dropping and buying stocks like crazy and throughout their families. Um, you know, in advance of major, you know, so, so that connection, I think that, that stuck out to me is just the ways in which, you know, the fact that actually the driving motivation is I can make a lot of money uh, and the way it's just kind of thrown away in that line that felt both um, uh, accurate as well as, you know, in both naming that that was true, but also the way in which nobody really wants to talk about it. That's why maybe um maybe we should head to the part of the plot where i think it diverges from what would happen in real life yeah. <laughs> which is the ending um so after after being a macho strong man uh, and shaking the hand of someone he knows has the white plague uh and, and it seems to be like this is clearly the way this disease is passed, you know like yeah you know um so the marshal contracts the disease uh, and realizes it after giving a speech on the eve of the attack of the neighboring country. Um, and so he, of course, wants to be cured and he and his daughter and future son-in-law, uh, the Baron's son, uh, call Dr. Galen. I guess they just have his number. Uh, and um, 
you know, beg him to cure the marshal. Galen sticks to his guns and says he won't do it uh, unless the marshal stops the war. And I guess the marshal has sort of a sort of fugue, you know, sort of episode uh, where he he's, you know, sort of losing his grip on reality or something and sort of with the cajoling of his daughter comes to the conclusion that instead of wanting him to make war, God wants him to make peace and he agrees. Um, that struck me as wholly out of character for a, a, a strong man type. Um, then, these are obvious spoilers, okay, so if you haven't seen the movie, uh, you know, watch it to the end. Uh, then Dr. Galen, upon, you know, having this agreement from the marshal, is heading toward uh, the marshal's headquarters and is stopped by the mob who wants war. And Galen does not act very prudently when he shouts opposite slogans to the slogans that the mob is shouting, you know, and, and says that they're fools and they should want peace instead. And, you know, it, the mob kills them. So the marshal ends up dying or sorry, sorry, uh, Galen ends up dying. And the marshal knows this. He discovers that Galen is dead and that the cure has apparently, you know, died with him. But then he sticks with the peace plan, which, which struck me as strange. Like I, I kind of felt like a, a real strongman type would say, well, all right, screw this. I'm dying anyway. You know, I'm going to take as many of the enemy as I can with me and, you know, spill as much blood as I can for the homeland. Uh, but instead he sticks with the peace plan, which struck me as unusually optimistic, I guess, from a writing standpoint. Yeah. I mean, so I would say, you know, I guess, I guess we're supposed to, you know, the, the idea is that, that it's a true change of heart in that moment and that he has truly uh, changed his position. It's not, um, it's not, uh, he's not acquiescing out of like, I need this cure and this is the only way to get it. It's, it's not a transactional agreement to, to, to go towards peace in this instance. Uh, and rather it's, it's an actual, no, we're going, you know, I actually no, you know, it's a pretty big transformation, but he's been converted to the cause of peace, to Galen's cause, I guess we would say. And uh, I just find it, you know, so in one sense that to me doesn't strike me as completely out of character, at least for topics, more dystopic um, works, is he usually, you know, if I think of something like RUR or War with the Newts, Things are pretty bad when when everything ends, but there's this kind of uh, you know moment of rebirth. You know, okay, you know, humanity, you get another shot. You know, we're gonna start from scratch and maybe try and do civilization better this time. Um, so at the end of R U R, you have this moment of well, maybe these two robots are gonna be the next Adam and Eve, or maybe there are Adam and Eve. You know, depending on how you read the story. Uh, in War with the Newts, it's like well. You know, maybe the newts all die. You know, like he, there's the last chapter of this novel. It's a very interestingly phrased novel. I highly encourage people to read it if, if you're looking for something good to read these days. Uh, is the author arguing with himself and trying not to basically kill all of humanity and, and condemn um, the earth to, you know, newts, all newts, no humans, which is basically, well, we taught the newts so well that we're still start killing each other. And maybe enough of us will be at high ground that once the newts have, you know, gone extinct because we killed them all, we can come back down and reconquer the land and maybe start again. And that's like the positivity of it. And I, you know, in one sense, there's an actual change of heart. We've somehow managed to change a dictator's heart. And yet the process by which has led <laughs> the cure to be destroyed, um, not, you know, um, you know, there is that sense that, you know, Galen did tell someone. Yeah, that's know, did subplot. Show one other person. Um, that subplot was kind of strange. Uh, so it was Dr. Martin, his former enemy, 
across the trench lines. Uh, they met in no man's land to cure people. And so he gives the, the instructions for the cure to this doctor who's apparently from the country that is being attacked. Um, the movie sort of ends, you know, it's feasible, I suppose, that eventually that doctor shares the cure with uh, this nation and the marshal and then, you know, that everybody's cured. The, the movie does not tell us that. Yeah. Uh, it's not clear. No, it's, it ends Galen. I mean, that's, that's how it's supposed to end, you know, and so it ends in this, um, it just ends in a much darker, in, in a way for me, much darker. I mean, I mean, in one sense, yes, it's perhaps optimistic that you could change this type of strong man dictator's mind long enough that he would keep with it, that he would actually, um, as he's dying, encourage people to maintain the peace, to keep the peace. Um, so that that's certainly an interesting, you know, that that feels, I suppose, hopeful, and yet it almost feels like it doesn't matter. Um, that even if you were to achieve this almost seemingly impossible task of changing the dictator, the marshal, the, the strong man's mind, and getting him to your cause to try and wage peace, not war, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> um, well, that, that seems to be indicated by the way the mob behaves. You know, the right. mob wants war for whatever reasons, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, just the political rhetoric or their own deeply held beliefs or economic motivations or whatever, you know, they, they don't want peace and they kill Galen because he advocates for peace. They, they call him a traitor. Um, also, they have not been told that their marshal has changed his mind yet. So in, in that sense, if they are, you know, following the leader, they don't know that the leader has changed yet. And so they well, haven't been given this, you know, whether they, like, it would be difficult to make that kind of switch, no matter what, but. Um, there's the uh, final scene in, in which the, uh, the marshal is giving an address remotely. <laughs> it's like a Zoom call uh, <laughs> from apparently the, the concentration camp colony for people with the disease, which is like, I, I'm sorry, I can't imagine anybody in our current leadership, uh, you know, sacrificing because it's the law or because it's for the greater good. Like, no, um, it's very difficult for me to believe uh, that aspect. Uh, but I agree, we don't see the people's ultimate response, which in my estimation would be to overthrow the government and install, you know, a new dictator, uh, because it seems like that's just where at least the mob that is there. Now, clearly the people like the, the accountant's family, there's much less sort of unified sentiment for dictatorship and for, you know, military expansion. Uh, you know, the mother is not keen on it. The, the son doesn't seem keen on it either. Uh, the daughter doesn't seem terribly political, uh, you know. So may maybe there would be more diversity of opinion uh, outside of an actual literal crowd of people screaming for war. Um, it, it, was, it was ambiguous, which in some ways is good. It, it leaves you room to think about it, which uh, I mentioned Twilight Zone, some of the, some of the good Twilight, episode, Twilight Zone episodes do that also, you know, they, they don't, they, they, they give you the twist and then the story stops and you don't know where it goes. Uh, so in some ways uh, that can be effective. I, was, I wasn't annoyed or disappointed or, you know, unfulfilled by the end of the story. I have right. questions, but they're interesting questions, not annoying questions. Uh, right. So I think it works in that way. I would agree. I mean, it's, it's your left to, you know, wonder, you know, in one sense, you know, there, there is no silver bullet. And, and that I think maybe proves how, how deep Dr. Galen's maybe naivete for lack of, or, or just, you know, he, it's like the problem is the leader and and it's not untrue <laughs> it's not untrue that the problem there was a problem in leadership you know they had a you know a warmongering marshal who who was thirst you know bloodthirsty for war and conquest and and 
didn't care how many people, how many heroes would be created. Um, and, and by that, I mean killed. Uh, so yes, there was a problem uh, with that, but you know, in that conversation with his, his old colleague slash enemy uh, in, from no man's land, you know, in the first war, uh, you know, he has, you know, he's standing up his, his fellow people saying, no, it's just, it's the marshal. They would want peace if, you know, they, they would want peace if they, they haven't been brought up to want peace. They've been brought up to want war. And so we have to bring them up to want peace. And, you know, you get the sense that he thinks it will be pretty easy to, to make that switch. And I think, you know, one thing we see here is that, you know, it's not just a change in leadership that will, uh, or a change in heart by the leadership that will lead, you know, it's a more complicated problem. And in a certain way that the, the naivete uh, and the, the attempt to have this, you know, twist savior saving at the end, you know, what I think what didn't, uh, the, uh, what Tolkien would call the you catastrophe, right? You, all hope is lost and then you actually grab victory from the jaws of defeat, you know, like, looks like the golem is going to get get the ring back and he falls into the fire and and the ring is destroyed and you know um uh for those lord of the ring fans out there watching this um uh and so we traffic is going to give us that moment right he's going to give us that you know this is before lord of the rings but you know he's going to give us a moment and we're going to have you know save your moment and everything's gonna work out and it's like yeah no actually no it's not all gonna work out it might but it's not that simple uh it definitely left me feeling a little defeated at the end of it in that sense um i don't think it's inaccurate uh solutions aren't that simple it's not you know um but it it definitely made that the uh, I, I was maybe uh, more eager for a simple, happy ending uh, than I realized until we got to the end of this movie and I went, oh, I would have liked that to end nicer. Um, and I even knew how it was going to end, so. So I suppose uh, in recommending it to people, um, you would recommend it to people who want alternate history, fiction, um, yeah. want allegory, political allegory. Uh, I wouldn't call it particularly satirical. You know, it, it wasn't funny in that way. Um, it was more allegorical than satirical. Uh, it, it does not have any sort of supernatural elements to it. Um, so it's, it's a pretty straight tale of uh, science and politics, I suppose. Um, you know, you have to be willing to read subtitles. Uh, you know, the, the, the dialogue is fast and heavy, you know, for, for the most part throughout the whole movie. Um, it's a dialogue heavy movie. Uh, and if you, if you miss subtitles, you know, you might kind of get lost in the plot. Um, I think overall it was very good though. I, I suppose we should mention it's black and white also. If you, if you have a particular beef against <laughs> black and white movies, this isn't going to be your cup of tea, but, um, you know, I don't, and I know you don't. Um, I suppose anybody with ties to the region probably would enjoy it for, to, to some degree, just as a slice of um, a, a, a certain worldview or a certain language or uh, it, it's not ostensibly Czech. Would you call it? Does, does it have a very strong Czech uh, worldview or outlook or tone? Uh, I would. I mean, in so much that it is very. It's so hard to. It's so chopek to me. It just reads like such a chopek film, a uh, chopek story. The the complexity of that, and so I would say in certain ways, whether you want to call that Czech or there's, you know, kind of that, a kind of central European, uh, uh, central Europeanness about it, I think is, is pro probably accurate. That, that if you find 
uh, kind of novels and plays and films from in general that part of the world interesting you will probably also like this one and I really have to say that the the reproduction value is very good uh, in, in the in the version we watched uh, so the quality is quite good so yes you have to read subtitles but they are legible for example you, oh, yeah. you're not gonna be like straining to read them uh, because they're not and they're placed well and, and things along that line so it, in that way it's fun I would also say that if, if you're just interested in thinking about, you know, in, in one way, I think you, you touched on it with this interaction of science and politics. If you're just interested in thinking about some of these um, big ideas of how, say, you know, big ideas play in the real world and, and you kind of, you know, want something that's kind of engaging and plot driven, but will kind of encourage, you know, thinking about that, you know, kind of how to, how to make political change in a certain way, <laughs> or or not make political change? Uh, this might be also quite interesting. Yeah, as a piece of cinema, I thought it was well done. There were some nice sort of crane shots, uh, you know, overlooking the crowds. The uh, the sets, especially in the the medical institute, were were nice. There were some nice camera angles. There were a few sort of clever shots, like when they were talking about living in camps, they shot through somebody's chair and it had these, this sort of crisscross pattern that looked like a fence or like bars. Um, but it's not horribly experimental or weird. It's not gonna, it's not like a Fellini film or something, you know, or Bergman or, you know, like it's very, it's straightforward for the most part camera shots and angles and looking at people. And so it was very easy to follow in that way, um, which helps when you're reading uh, subtitles, and, you know, and the film's not in the language that you, that you know. Uh, I was able to follow it. I, there were maybe one or two times when I just sk skipped back a little bit to make sure I didn't miss something. Otherwise it was, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. I think it's a pretty accessible film. I think you mentioned that earlier in our kind of run up start of the commentary. And I think that's a good, a good way to, there's not going to be a lot of baggage either in terms of how it's shot or even, you know, uh, the, the dialogue, even with subtitles of, um, uh, that's going to be a barrier to understanding the, the plot moves in a way that's easy to follow. There's there's really only like one, there's that one flashback, clearly a flashback. It's it's right in the moment when it happens and it informs this, the next scene. It's very, you know, so it um, there's not a lot going on in that way to to keep, to, to con be confusing in that way. And yeah, so, and there's there's not a ton of uh, complex character names even, uh, you know, like in some Russian movies where you're like, wait, is that Svidrigailov or is that Raskolnik? It's like, I can't keep all these names straight. These names are pretty straightforward uh, to an English speaking ear, I think. Uh, and the marshal is just the marshal and he's always wearing his costume. So you'll never be confused as to whether it's the marshal or not. Who the marshal is that is never going to be uh, confusing, and I would just say that um, I think it, you know, in that sense of some of the, the ideas and themes we've been talking about that are, you know, that that we found interesting in that it, it you know, it kind of lets those just breathe and speak for themselves, uh, and it doesn't, they're not hard to find. It's it's not trying to hide what this film is about. You know, you're not going to be like, is this film about fascism? Yes, yes, this film is about fascism. It's not hiding it. Um, so it's not trying to hide what the film is about. It's not trying to make you, you know, dig for it in that way, for better or worse. I, I think it, it works well. It makes it, a, you know, in that sense of, of making it accessible, it's a good, like if you were just like, I would like to try a film from the, you know, maybe I'd like to try a, a foreign film from the from the 30s. This is a good accessible start for that, if that's something that you're interested in, so. I think it's also a, a good film if you're looking for topical. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, if, if you want a pandemic film with 
very very poorly thought out political decisions and leadership. Uh, this, is, this is, yeah, very, yeah. <laughs> very, very good for the moment. Um, it does have that there sort can of- Can people in the 1930s make a film about the 2020s? Yeah, yeah, they can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this would be that film. <laughs> I think it would appeal to people who are interested in the the uh, interregnum, you know, in between war period, and the yes. sort of yeah. mentality and uh, philosophies that led to <laughs> the eventual conflagration of World War II. Um, you know, th this fictionalizes them in a way that. Is definitely very digestible and uh you know the, the themes like you say you know they're not hidden like it's it's clear who's the hitler or mussolini analog and who's the you know sort of naive pacifist and you know uh, but it's got it's got an epidemic you know so <laughs> <laughs> you'll definitely find something <laughs> to relate to uh in this movie it was very relatable i guess that's a good way of putting it yeah. And, and I think it would, it, you know, it, it is, it is hyper relatable at this particular moment. I think, uh, um, I, I think you would find things that would be relatable at almost any moment, uh, depending on the particular situation you happen to be in. Uh, if I think of, you know, various moments in the past, you know, whether it's the militarism, the disease angle, you know, uh, the, the capitalism angle, I, you know, we happen to be living in that, you know, as all of these three, three things intersect uh, in a very obvious way. And, and that's what's happening in this film as well. And so I think that is what makes it speak uh, so strongly uh, at this moment. But uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, in, uh, five, 10 years, it probably will still have something to say to the, whatever's going on then. Yeah, well, so um, thumbs up for me. Thumbs up for me as well. That's, that's two thumbs <laughs> up. Chicago style, two thumbs up. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should watch it. Whoever's, whoever's watching this video, you should, you should have already watched the movie at this point. I hope you didn't watch this whole video without having watched the movie. Uh, so I hope but if somebody, I, I, do, I do think you will have lots of, you now have lots of spoilers, but I do think it's still worth going and watching. And if you enjoyed this and would like to see us do more of these, let us know and, you know, maybe suggest some other films from uh, our region, you know. So we are the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. So. Uh, you know, if, if there's something you think we should watch, let us know what it is and uh, we'll, we'll add it to the list. With subtitles. Yeah, subtitles are, we are, we are trying to watch films that are accessible to a wide audience uh, in our area. So uh, an English speaking audience at this point. So we are looking for subtitles as well. So. All right, it's a pleasure talking to you, Esther. It was great talking to you, Matthew. All right. I guess that's it. Yep. <laughs>